Hello, my name is Anne Lietz. I'm a member of the European Parliament of the S&D Group and I have a guest today uh, from Syria but also from France. Um, Mrs. Kodmani, she's a director of the Arab Reform Initiative and you're also a member of the Syrian Democratic Opposition but you're living right now in Paris. Welcome to the European Parliament. Thank you for joining Thank you. Us. Thank you. We have discussed today the situation on Syria and as I mentioned you are a part of the Syrian Democratic Opposition. How is the latest stand on the situation of a possible constitution? How is the situation on the ground and how is the situation discussed? Well, as you probably know, we've had a terrible two weeks of a very massive offensive by the Assad forces with the Iran-led militias and Russian air cover in the southwest of Syria. So there's been a lot of violence and another 350,000 refugees leaving their homes in the southwest of Syria. Mm -hmm. Uh, nevertheless, as a political opposition, uh, we believe that anything achieved militarily on the ground is not going to bring about a settlement. So this illusion that Assad has that he will solve it all militarily, we are saying uh, you, uh, the, the, the political battle is now and the real battle is a political one because a solution requires a political arrangement. So we have put forward our uh, list of candidates for a constitutional commission mm -hmm. at the request of the United Nations, a special envoy, uh, that we have a constitutional commission in the coming weeks and months that actually drafts a new constitution for Syria mm -hmm. and this uh, constitution Constitutional Commission will be composed of one-third opposition, one-third regime, and one-third appointed by the UN, more neutral in civil society, and maybe more women in that uh, third third. So we have worked on this and we have delivered to the UN because we are very committed to a political process. Uh, we want a new constitution, a democratic constitution mm -hmm. that gives us rule of law, that gives us uh, uh, end of impunity, that uh, sets uh, a democratic governance system for the country and hopefully later on uh, some elections. Ms. Kurmani, where do you see your challenges right now, in particular from your government uh, we talked a lot about the situation on the refugees due to the new crisis which occurred through new pressure from the military, but also what is new from the government being set up in terms of the refugees which are outside the country already? Well, one very alarming signal that we have, uh, we are receiving from the Assad regime is that his people are saying explicitly, we don't want the return of refugees to Syria. And in t on top of that, we had uh, a month or a half ago, a law voted, not voted, there's no parliament, it's a decree that Assad uh, 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 enacted, which actually is going to lead to the expropriation, massive expropriation of people mm -hmm. in Syria who will lose their land, their homes and the rights to uh, the place to go back to. Mm -hmm. So while we are talking about the return of refugees from Lebanon, from Jordan, possibly from Turkey, the regime is doing things on the ground that are uh, extremely, extremely damaging to any prospect of the return of refugees. It may make it impossible for these refugees to come back. So I think the alarm bell should be sounded at this point and this law should be revoked mm -hmm. uh, and pressure should be uh, put on the regime, on Russia, to say this is an unacceptable measure that damages European interests who are hosting refugees. Regional uh, countries who are hosting refugees, they have a stake, a very high stake in this, and this law is not just a Syrian internal matter, it is going to affect the return of refugees to Syria. Totally agree with you on that fact. We are the biggest giver for humanitarian aid to somehow support the refugee situation. Even Europe doesn't take enough refugees. If you look at the Lebanon just uh, uh, around the corner, having a big pressure now inside their own country, all because of that. But the rule of Europe should be uh, also putting that onto the plate and on the table to discuss it. But also, where else do you see the role of Europe in this particular situation, also for the region? If you look, for example, on Iran, Turkey, but also on Russia. 
I think where Europe needs to look at what it has, what it controls in terms of assets and what it can use its leverage, it can use it in different ways. One of them is it represents democracy and rule of law. Mm -hmm. uh, it can say that if it is going to deal with Syria, it needs rule of law no matter what. Mm -hmm. It needs a credible judiciary that can actually set a legal framework and, a, and allow it to operate. Otherwise, how can you continue these mafia practices of the regime? And how can you uh, speak to a regime that still uh, every week we have people dying under torture inside the, the prisons of Assad. So it is not easy to say that the uh, uh, security agencies are going to continue killing and torturing and arresting arbitrarily. So rule of law is one major uh, area where the European Union can actually and very concretely say need to suspend horrible extraordinary jurisdictions, mm -hmm. awful laws that allow these arbitrary practices, ends the impunity of security agencies, etc. There's another area, of course, it is the economic and financial uh, leverage that Europe has. On reconstruction in Syria, Russia wants reconstruction. Russia wants to see legitimacy built and something, some normalcy coming back to Syria. The key player here is Europe. Mm -hmm. Extending a carrot to Russia, not to the regime, because the regime is not reasonable, but Russia has a rational way of thinking, and Russia understands that Europe needs to have a number of conditions in place, some criteria to agree to uh, give money for reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So Russia cares about that, and Europe has weight to, uh, to put in this, uh, in this discussion. The, th the, the third area, I think, is that uh, the European Union is a major partner for uh, Iran as well as for Turkey. These two countries are playing different roles in Syria, particularly Iran is one country that is, has no interest at the moment in seeing a political solution and a political transition in Syria. It is holding on to Assad, his practices, his horrible security apparatus to, to um, basically develop the presence of uh, militias, uh, sectarian militias, uh, which will continue to attract terrorism uh, and jihadism into Syria if, it, if we maintain those sectarian militias. So I think Europe understands uh, the stakes for Syria and Europe is saying to R Iran, we are in favor of maintaining the nuclear uh, agreement, the G JCPOA. Uh, we, unlike the United States, want to have a good relationship with you and want to extend the dividends of this agreement. This is where Europe can also say, there's a quid pro quo to that. Your behavior in Syria, we cannot ignore. So if you want us to continue advocating for the JCPOA and for, uh, you know, lifting sanctions and normalizing with you and providing you with some of the economic benefits of this, your behavior in Syria has also to change. And commitment of Iran led militias out of the country. Iran getting those militias out of the country is a major uh, condition for a, a settlement in Syria. There is no settlement without that happening. Thank you very much for your insights. I hope uh, that the coalition forming of this group is going to happen. That is a lot of setbacks throughout the last years. Thank you so much for your involvement in coming to the European Parliament. I hope we stay in touch on that issues and we stand on your side building a new framework for Syria as we all need for this region and for the country. Finally, a new opp opportunity, a situation that people can return and that you have a country which is building up again where it used to stand. We count on you. Thank you very much. Thank you.